Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Katie. I'm adding up Addingtons. And if you have a child with sensory processing disorder or other sensory needs, sometimes it can be overwhelming to know how to help them and what sort of strategies to use at home to help your kids cope with life. I have multiple children with sensory needs and I want to show you today some very simple uh, techniques and accommodations that we have in place in our home to help our children um, and hopefully give you some ideas to help yours. Well, if this is your first time stopping by, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I am Katie. I am a mother of eight. We own our own company that my husband founded. We homeschool our kids. We love to travel and adventure. We're former foster parents. We're an adoptive family. We have special needs. And uh, I love to encourage you guys. So I would love for you to hit that subscribe button down below and stick around with us. So if you have a child with uh, sensory needs, um, or if you have a child who's just been diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, it can all be a little bit overwhelming and you may not even know where to start. Um, and I know that feeling because we have kids with sensory needs. Um, and so over the years we have learned what helps them and um, what kinds of things make life easier for them. Um, and so I am going to just share some of the things that we have around our house. Anything that I can find links to, I will leave down below. My daughters are gonna come around the house with me and sort of show you uh, some of their favorite things. First of all, let's uh, let's talk about what, what does this even mean? We can hear sometimes the terms sensory needs, sensory processing disorder, uh, sensory averse, sensory seeking. What is all of that and uh, what does it mean? Now, I am not a doctor. So um, please don't take this as medical advice. I'm just a mom who uh, deals with sensory kiddos in everyday life. Um, and so um, always consult with your doctor on everything, obviously, uh, but just throw that caveat in there. Sensory issues. So our sensory system is how our bodies take in information through our senses. So, I mean, we all studied the five primary senses in elementary school, um, but we also have sensory systems in our body that, um, that take in like movement information. Is our body moving? What position is our body in? Are we hanging upside down? Are we laying on our side? Are we bending over? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and so all of those different uh, sensory systems, along with taste, touch, sight, sound, all of the, the normal ones that we think about, um, but as well as like position and movement and that kind of thing. And, and then like also like emotional things. Are, we feel our emotions. <laughs> um, so all of those sensory systems, our brains take in information from all of those things. They process where we are, what we're doing, what our surroundings are like, and how we're supposed to react to them. And then um, tell our body how to react to that information. So what happens when there is a sensory processing issue is that a person's brain does not process the information in an average way. Now there is a range of what's considered normal, but um, there's two ways it could go. Either the brain overreacts to sensory information um, or it underreacts to sensory information. Um, and what we see in life then is how it affects someone's behavior. Um, so a lot of times we think of it as like a behavioral issue because that's what we can see, but really what's happening is the way someone's brain is processing the information from their nerves and sensory systems um, in the first place. It just plays out in their behavior it's not, um, it's not something they can just choose to change the way they're reacting. It's actually like fundamentally in their brain. When someone is a sensory under reactor, um, it means that it takes more sensory input, um, 
before they can make sense of that information <laughs> and know what to do with it. So these are the sensory seekers. Now this is what we have primarily in our family. They have to have more, bigger, louder, stronger, um, that kind of thing before their brains are able to make sense of the information. So you'll see that they talk way too loud for the uh, situation. They are very, they have to lay on things and lean on things and they're always touching things. Um, these are the kids that play with their food and rub it all over their faces <laughs> um, and who like to run and jump and climb and, uh, you know, they tend to be kind of rough. Those are sensory seekers. Their brain is under registering the sensory information coming in. So the flip side of this is people whose brains overreact to sensory information. Every little bit of sensory information is overwhelming. And so these are what we call sensory averse. Um, these are the kids that don't like tags or seams in their clothing. They're the ones that don't like to try new foods, um, that kind of thing. So both sides of this coin are a similar problem. It just has to do with whether um, their brains underreact or overreact to sensory information. So how do you help your kids with um, sensory input issues. Um, so let me just take you around our house and our yard and show you some of the things um, that we have built into our everyday lives. Hopefully this is encouraging to you that it is doable um, and it's not big or complicated or medically complex. So let's start outside. One of the biggest things that uh, we love, love, love is our trampoline. Um, now we have a great big outdoor trampoline with the net around it. Um, you may just get at one point when the kids were younger, we had just a little like exercise individual sized uh, trampoline that we had in our playroom with the handlebar on it so they could stand in place and jump on it. Um, that allows for a lot of pressure through their bodies. Um, it allows big movements, big feelings, um, all that pressure of their body compressing on itself and then lifting back up. That provides extra sensory information about how they're moving, um, how hard something is pressing on their body. And that gives them enough input that, okay, now their brain is filled up with the sensory input it needs and they can handle other activities. Uh, swings, <laughs> swings of all types are really great. Um, now you'll see that we actually don't currently have any like traditional swings in our yard, um, hopefully at one point, but we have a rope swing. It's just a piece of rope hung off of a tree. We have a good old fashioned tire swing. Um, and then we have a platform swing that can swing in lots of different directions. So they can be laying down, they can be sitting up, they can even be standing on it, they can be on their belly. Um, so all of these swings, I had an occupational therapist uh, tell me once that swinging engages like seven out of eight or seven out of nine uh, different sensory systems. Um, and so it can be very, very regulating for kids of, of all sensory types. Um, my girls are <laughs> sensory seeking and they love to swing. Um, I have a friend whose son is very sensory averse and he loves swinging. Um, it can be very regulating for both sides of that. Swings of any kind, whether big or small, I know you can even find some that like clip onto the door frames in your home so that they can swing inside. Um, if you don't live in a climate that is conducive to being outside year round like we do, um, but that swinging action uh, is very, very helpful for kiddos with sensory processing issues. All right, next up is our giant sandbox. We have a 10 foot by 10 foot sandbox in our backyard. Obviously this does not need to be that big. If you live in an apartment, you can get a box of kinetic sand that like sticks together. But that um, feeling, the feel of the texture of the sand in their hands can help 
uh, regulate their brains, whether you're sensory averse and they don't like the texture, like practicing writing with just one finger um, can really help them get used to new textures. Uh, for my kids who are sensory seekers, um, having their whole bodies in it and digging and moving it around, it helps them with big motions and pressure um, and texture and that kind of thing. So um, sand is great. The one thing that we love is our climbing wall. Um, using those big big body muscles and having to balance and shift weight and pull with different parts of their bodies is so, so, so good for our sensory seekers to help them um, with that movement and motion and pressure and position. Um, those sensory inputs, um, that has been so helpful. It helps strengthen their hands, even if you want to talk about like academic skills. Um, it strengthens their hand muscles um, and being able to like grip and let go for um, writing preparation. Um, it's really great for that, so we enjoy that. Monkey bars, same thing, motion, um, position, pressure. Um, hanging upside down obviously with sensory seekers they like to be in all kinds of strange positions um, to see how that feels um, so monkey bars are really great just I mean honestly playground equipment in general letting them do those big movements and be in different positions and feeling the pressure on their bodies in different ways um, once their brain is full up with that sensory information, they're much more likely to be able to like pay attention to what they're seeing or pay attention to what they're hearing. Um, if they're not trying to like fill up their sensory buckets um, as they go, those things are all super helpful. All right, so let's move on to inside our house. Um, one thing that we did a couple years ago that I love, 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 and has been so good for our girls is we got these compression sheets to fit around their beds. Um, now, most people have heard about weighted blankets. They know that that pressure on your body is good. These compression sheets, rather than being like heavy and dense and, and extra warm, are breathable and stretchable and elastic, but they still provide that sort of deep body pressure to help keep the sensory tank full for kiddos. Um, so our girls love these. They um, definitely improved their sleep quality. Um, they definitely feel more comfortable trying to fall asleep. My girls love to be like completely pressed down in their beds. They like the pressure. They like the weight. Um, they like, I, I have a friend whose child doesn't like to have anything above um, like their armpits. They don't like to have their heads or necks or shoulders covered. My girls do. <laughs> they love to be like wrapped up all snuggled um, in their bed. So these compression sheets I just ordered on Amazon. Um, they are not very expensive, but they have been absolutely worth every penny. All right. And then um, this is something we learned in occupational therapy, but brushing protocols. Um, you can see here that my daughter has a therapy brush. It has like soft plastic bristles that are, um, they're not scratchy, they're very soft. Um, and so just rubbing that on their arms and their skin, um, they love their arms and their shoulders and their legs. And Jojo in particular really loves like the palms of her hands. Um, to be brushed and when I first heard about this I thought it sounded really super weird like, but I'm a believer it definitely helps it is very again when um, especially when my girls were really little when they would have like emotional meltdowns and they would get really upset and you could see them start to like spiral into this tailspin we could get that brush and start brushing and that regular calming sensory input filled up their like nervous system enough that then they could make sense of their emotions. If you just look up brushing protocols, um, these brushes were like $11 for a two pack on Amazon. I don't know what they are now, but when I ordered them, that's what they were. 
Um, so they're not expensive. So hopefully that has given you some ideas for just easy ways um, to accommodate your sensory kiddos around the house. None of these are super complicated, but they have become everyday parts of our lives and really helped um, our kids to regulate um, and to make sense of their sensory needs. And they're not they're not medically complex, right? I can send my kids out to say, hey, go play in the backyard, go jump on the trampoline or swing on the swings or play in the sandbox or do something that it's fun for them. It's enjoyable and it helps regulate their bodies and their minds and they um, can better function in some of the other aspects of life. Like if you send a kid out to swing on the swings for 10 minutes, just of all of that sensory input before they have to come in and sit to do schoolwork. Getting some of that big sensory input can make a huge ability in the way that they process other information throughout the day. Um, so it's not a it's not a hard thing. It's not a big deal, um, but it makes a huge difference in their ability to process normal uh, sensory information to be able to see and hear. Um, and sit better. Um, so anyway, hopefully that gave you some ideas uh, of easy ways to meet sensory needs in your home. Uh, let me know in the comments down below if you have any other questions. Um, be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you got some ideas from it. Don't forget to subscribe down below and I will see you next time. Love you guys.